Oi oi, it's your boy. The ginger spice of writing ninja shit for Vice. Jack Slack, it's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Wednesday. Um, have you ever wondered what Michelle Ward, what damage Michelle Waterson's kicks could do at 125 pounds? No? Well, you're going to find out this weekend. Because we did have TJ Dillashaw versus Corey Sanhagen to look forward to, and then that got cancelled. So, wh- you know, what do you do when a great fight gets cancelled? You go, Michelle Waterson, you got five rounds. Get in there and kick air. But that is a this weekend problem. Let's start with some last weekend problems, because I wasn't here on Monday. It was uh, Maybank holiday, very important day to show solidarity with uh, trade unions around the world. And also just, uh, that's that's what we do in Britain. It's a, a bank holiday, first Monday of May. They make you decorate the Maypole, and then everyone has to dance around it. And if you don't show up, you open yourself up to a witchcraft accusation. Not even joking. Been doing all this research into the... Um, the uh, Hopkins uh, witch hysteria that happened in Britain in the 1600s. And um, yeah, genuinely, if you didn't turn up for like the maypole decorating, but you just left yourself wide open for a uh, witchcraft accusation. And you also had to be taking note of what everyone else was doing in case you needed to make a counter witchcraft accusation. But yes, so I wasn't around on Monday and here I am now. So we had some stuff happen at the weekend and... Some of it was good. There were a, it was a lot of decisions. There weren't a lot of big knockouts like, say, UFC 261, which happened the other week. But it was a strange fight week anyway because Diego Sanchez was cut from the UFC uh, in the lead up to the weekend. And this whole thing's so sketchy beyond belief. You know, they cut him allegedly because of the erratic behavior of his manager. And then they released some videos of his manager being erratic. But that was like seven months ago. Um, basically, his manager... Sorry, Joshua Fabia, his like kooky guru, um, requested all his medicals and the UFC were like, "Uh oh, lawsuit coming and immediately cut him because, you know, of the Mark Hunt thing in the past. Um, The weird part was Rashad Evans coming out and and hitting Diego up in the Instagram comments and being like, you've got to ditch this guy, Fabia, blah, blah, blah. You know, the UFC has been so kind to you and so on. I I can't quite uh, articulate the point I'm trying to make, but there there is a weird thing about Rashad Evans, who the UFC knowingly shopped around to multiple commissions because they couldn't get him cleared based on his MRIs, um, trying to stop Diego Sanchez from being litigious with his own brain damage. Um, there's some more work that needs to be done there. I can't quite say what I'm thinking, but, you know, it's sketchy. Um, but it's interesting because we're getting both sides of like the uh, Bullshido this weekend or last weekend. We had Diego Sanchez's weird coach who wants to hit people with the power of love and stuff like that. Does all the sistema bollocks, um, chases people around the cage with a, with a fake knife. Uh, and then you've got Jury Prochaska who loves the Book of Five Rings, which is top tier weeb shit, but also something I've written about in the past. Sadly, can't find those articles anymore because of uh, Fightland going under. But something we're going to talk about uh, pretty extensively. So Jerry Prochaska, let's get into him because he was phenomenal this weekend. Um, Dominic Reyes, like, if you say something like, this isn't rising, it plays badly next to footage of you being knocked out or a photo of you face down. But Dominic Reyes was right. (laughs) Even if you're the biggest rising fan in the world, and I quite like rising, pretending that they had like a strong light heavyweight division is absurd. They were bussing in C.B. Dolloway off like a four-fight losing streak in the UFC and then one outside. Um, They were getting in the ghost of Fabio Maldonado. You know, these people who just are not world-class light heavyweights. So, of course, if you come into the UFC and you fight Volkan Uzdemir and Dominic Reyes, that's a massive step up in competition. Uh, The fun part is, of course, that Jiri walked through that uh, change in competition. Well, not walked through. I mean, both of them blasted him, caught him dead to rights multiple times, and he just sort of walked through it. Um, I was writing something about this fight and then I got down the Musashi rabbit hole uh, because it is such an interesting topic. And since then, I have ordered, you know, like the life giving sword, unfettered mind, all all the uh, Bullshido books and, you know, revisiting um, the Gorin no show itself. 
and uh, it's probably going to be a bigger project that so that article's probably not going to be finished um anytime soon but there was a lot of stuff that I like from during this fight there was a lot of stuff that um was a little bit concerning but in sort of going through Jiri's career back to Ryzen, I think one of the things that is, is pretty interesting about Jiri is that like a lot of other strikers, he had this Muay Thai career and then immediately fell into basically just punching uh, in MMA. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, mainly it's the obvious one is like if you throw a lot of kicks, you're going to get a kick caught and you're just asking to be bundled over. But more than that, you, you know, throwing your hands gives you the most mobility and the most base. You know, you have your feet under you at all times while you're throwing your hands, if you're throwing them well. Um, so it's more of a stability thing. He throws the odd kick, obviously, he threw up that left high kick to to start the ending sequence against Volkan Uzdemir. Um, and in all his fights, and in both his UFC fights, he does multiple times from Orthodox. He will wave his right hand out to the side and then throw a right front kick. Uh, I, I put up a little Twitter thread of clips of that. But... Um, yeah, it's a pretty cool little trick. Um, he gravitated towards the hands low stance quite early on. Again, another big like striker tendency in MMA. If you can keep your hands lower, you know, you've got good reactions against things that you're used to seeing, like punches and kicks and elbows and knees. Um, and you're probably at a bit of a disadvantage on level changes and wrestling. So you set yourself up automatically to be a step ahead in those things and rely on your reactions for the things that you've spent more time dealing with. But the other upshot, of course, is that your hands come from uh, below the opponent's field of vision a lot of the time. So you see Jury intercepting people with like up jabs and uppercuts off the lead hand. Caught Uzdemir a couple of times, caught um, Reyes on one leg. And you see him throwing the right hand lead an awful lot. You know, that's a real standout feature of his game. Or the, you know, the left hand lead off the southpaw stance. But throwing his rear hand first, um, basically off his chest or off his uh, off his belly when he's doing that weird hand holding thing in front of his stomach. Um, but he catches a lot of dudes out with that. Partly because of his extremely long reach. Partly because he throws the hand first and not the shoulder. If you throw the shoulder first, that's an obvious tell to everyone. Um, and obviously because it's coming from in front of his like belly button, it doesn't have to come all the way across his shoulders. If you watch the one that he, I mean, he just couldn't miss Jake Hyun with, um, Hyun, Hyun, Jake in Rising. He couldn't miss him with the uh, right straight, right, la- right hand leads rather. Um, but what was really encouraging going back through Jiri's fights is that he's like from his first, from his first Rising fights, he will flick out the jab. You know, he's always moving, he's moving forward most of the time. He's a very aggressive fighter, but he'll flick out the jab and immediately start moving his head because he wants the opponent coming back. And if you notice all these knockouts, or most of them, um, they, they happen when guys come back at him. Like that Bruno guy in Rising knocked, de- uh, knocked out or knocked down as he was moving backwards. A lot of his best counters on people like King Mo and uh, Uzdemir were as they were moving in on him. Um, yeah, he's a really hmm, interesting character. Uh, I mean, let's touch on the Book of Five Rings and why it's it's so interesting. Um, the Gurren No Show, I did, like I said, I wrote two big pieces for Vice a long time ago uh, on Fightland, and I think they disappeared now, which is a real shame. Um, but it's probably worth a revisit. The Book of Five Rings is by legendary Japanese swordsman Miyamoto Musashi, or Musashi Miyamoto. Uh, I try and respect both on this podcast, but because you never know which one people are actually doing, um, whether they've they've done like Christian uh, family name first, given name second, or the other way around. Uh, you, you end up just using both. Um, but the thing about Musashi was, well, this this comes into like a larger conversation about Bushido, which is something that I've been quite critical about in the past. Um, partly because like it was, you know, there was a system in um, Britain and Europe during the Middle Ages or, or like the early modern period called chivalry. Uh, which was basically like a code of etiquette. And Bushido is sort of that. And then after, you know, years and years after the fact, it was made into this, like, um, you know, sacrifice yourself for, like, really um, tenuous reasons. <laughs> Started out with a few books like Hagakura and the Life-Giving Sword and stuff, and it turned into an ideology that was used to convince young men to jump on planes with, like, a quarter tank of fuel, you know, with with no way to get back. Um so yeah, Bushido, very sketchy. And uh, even in the modern era, you know, it's been like culturally appropriated or whatever you want to say, but 
I mean, I don't really care about cultural appropriation much. I think, cool, if you find something cool about another culture, go ahead, use it. Um, but the Bushido thing has sort of been, like, co-opted by martial artists and, and fighters especially to, like, justify letting your fighter go out for another round to get his ass kicked when he's got no hope of winning and he's lost every previous round. You're like, oh, well, he's being a warrior. You're like, mm, no, not really. And it, it's so distant from what like the samurai were for most of their existence well not most of their existence but like for a couple of hundred years there were no wars in japan and samurai who were like a professional warring class basically just sat around making poetry and paintings and shit like that and you know there is a degree of that with people like mustache they're they're into the artistic side and the zen um but what marks out someone like Musashi's work from a lot of stuff about Bushido is that it was written by a guy who was literally a duelist. You know, it's interesting that he served in a couple of battles, but that, you know, his thoughts as like a military strategist aren't particularly amazing. You know, he was just a grunt in battles, basically. Um, but there are very few instances of a guy who went out seeking the best swordsman and and bow staff users and whatever else to fight to the death a lot of the time um and then lived long enough to write his experiences down and, and what he thought was important in a life and death fight and that's Musashi's value you know he was a duelist it's a profession that doesn't exist you know like there are no professional duelists anymore um and it was a very weird point in time when it did exist but we do know that Musashi was a real person and that he did fight some um really notable or other notable swordsmen. So frame it like that, and, you know, it's quite interesting because the stakes are so much higher in Musashi's one-on-one uh, -on -one combative career than basically anyone else. <laughs> um, which is what I think marks him out from, like, the rest of, sort of, all the other stuff he gets lumped in with. And we're, like, you know, it, back in the early 2000s, 2010s, Musashi was sort of like all, uh, you know, he was at peak saturation. Business colleges made you read him. Basically, you couldn't go to a presentation without someone quoting Musashi or Sun Tzu at you uh, regarding like their stock picks or something. Um, and now we've, we've moved away from that a little bit. So I think Musashi is going to have a little bit of a cooling off period. And, and, and now we can appreciate him as a cool guy again and uh, someone who had interesting things to say particularly i think more than sun tzu or anyone like that he particularly is uh has things to say to martial artists you know people who are or not even martial artists like combat combat sports athletes and things like that i don't think sun tzu really has that much to offer the combat sports athlete other than like philosophical overviews but like the meat of what musashi talks about i mean there's there's five books in the book of five rings or five chapters or five scrolls or whatever you want to call them and you know they had their uh, earth wind fire water and emptiness and i think emptiness is more of a um philosophical chapter i honestly can't remember all the details it's been a little while since i read it but uh i think fire is one-on-one -on -one combat and then like earth is combat in a battle or something like that but the the, the interesting chapters are the the um the emptiness one and the one about one-on-one -on -one combat and misashi's big into i mean we talk about ferrying cross quite a lot which is like his sort of don't overthink footwork your foot your footwork is just to get you in and out um but he also talks a lot about like openings creating openings spotting openings taking the initiative um you know making the opponent feel strong so that they overextended you counter them or if they don't look if you see like a moment of weakness just move in and mercilessly crush them and i think you can see a bit of that in jiri prochaska's uh fighting you know he goes forward from the start and convinces the opponent that if they don't fight back, he's just going to overwhelm them. And then when they do fight back, that's when he lands a lot of his best blows. Particularly like backstepping counters. And that is something that's interesting because it's something that he does from both stances against both stances. So sometimes he'll, he'll like from orthodox, step back to southpaw and throw a southpaw right hook. And sometimes they'll have to go like over the opponent's lead shoulder because they'll stay orthodox. Sometimes they'll chase him like Uzdemir did and they'll eat the, the right hook flush on the chin or a right uppercut flush on the chin. And he doesn't have any real control over what the opponent does. Um, he just moves back and throws his hands. Which is interesting because, you know, a lot of switch hitters, the, the idea is to keep an eye on what the opponent's stance does so that you can select your attacks to what best fits. 
Whereas Jerry doesn't seem to care. Uh, <laughs> so th- yeah, that's that's um, an interesting quirk of his game. But the shifting back and forward generally is uh, really something that he does that you won't see a lot of guys do, particularly at that higher weight range. But in the course of like trying to overwhelm people and then asking them to throw back, he sometimes gets too into overwhelming people and they do throw back and hit him in the face. And that happened with Uzdemir, but it really happened quite notably several times here against Reyes, who, as we said, has an awesome counter left hand. Um, and you know, before the fight, we said Reyes likes a nice clean fight. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how messy Jiri can make it. And he really did make it messy. He was all over him from the get go. Um, but he got blasted, you know, Jiri got blasted multiple times with the left straight to the face. And then on the ground, he got up kicked. And afterwards, he was talking to Bisping and he was like, yeah, I was knocked out by that. <laughs> Which, again, another sort of interesting quirk of his character that he'll just say that and, and tell you about it. Um, you've got to really respect that. I suppose he sort of reminds me of Justin Gaethje, where, or like Justin Gaethje back in the day, where you can see that at some point he's going to, you know, someone is going to undo this and it could probably be pretty disastrous for him. Um, but he is deliberately fighting in a way that brings the most entertainment and has a you know high chance of um, allowing him to finish the opponent. I think, you know, he's now moved himself into basically immediate title contention. I think he's ranked number two at light heavyweight now, which fair enough, because he, he just beat two of like the top contenders back to back and starched them outright. But... The, you know, it's interesting him matching up against uh, Jan Blakowicz because Blakowicz, while he doesn't have an awful lot of KOs, which is something we always, it, it's kind of the um, paradox of Jan, Blacho, uh, Jan Blachowicz, really powerful hitter, doesn't have a lot of knockouts. Same with Fedor, you know, only in the last years of his career did he start picking up actually knockouts. You know, he, he was just this huge hitter who ended up submitting a lot of people. Um, but Jan, Blacho, Jan Blachowicz has the kind of power that could be very problematic for Jiri if he just sort of walks onto it. Um, you know, the the problem is that I don't think if you're fighting someone like Jiri Prochaska, and I mean, how many people are there like Jiri Prochaska? Um, if you're fighting him, it's kind of like the Diaz thing I do, and Justin Gaethje back in the day. I wouldn't ever want anyone to come in with the game plan of I just hit different, you know? <laughs> like, we talked about the Diaz's back in the day, but like, if these guys have walked through the best blows of a lot of other fighters, don't build your game plan around like, yeah, but he's not been hit by me. You want to take advantage of the stuff that you can, you know, reliably do that won't matter if his chin is just like superhuman that day. Um, you know, things like, I mean, with Jiri, I'm very intrigued by Jiri versus John Jones because of John Jones's ability to control distance, stay off the fence and, um, you know, can repeatedly jam with the uh, lead leg, you know, jam the lead leg with the side kicks and the oblique kicks and body kick while he's backing up and, of course, move into clinches and, and threaten the wrestling. You know, I think Jerry's game thrives if you move back, you know, if you're always moving back, if you're getting trapped against the fence and if you're just letting him, you know, swing freely. I think John Jones has, you know, a very well-documented history of uh, picking at people's lead legs, stamping on it if they just want to keep closing on him uh, and and tying them up if they get too close. Um would John Jones engage in a stupid point fighting kickboxing contest and lose on low kicks like he did against Thiago Santos and uh, Dominic Reyes? Maybe. But I think the style that he has used throughout his career, for the most part, um, puts him in good stead to beat Jiri Prochaska. I think, you know, he's got so many tools to avoid the one area of the fight where Jiri is so dangerous and the, you know, the smarts to actually do that. I don't think I even mentioned the knockout, but yeah, back elbow along the fence. Dope. Is there anything else to say about that fight? I think it was just awesome. I think I'm going to do something more about Jiri Prochaska, Prochaska, Prochaska in the future. I'm going to do some stuff on like the Book of Five Rings and, and frame it all in that device because I think that's well interesting. Um, how cool is it that the light heavyweight, you know, the light heavyweight division is shit, but the, the next light heavyweight title fight is between a man who goes and touches, you know, before every fight, touches a a piece of a noose in the forest um, and a guy who is the basically Czech Musashi. I almost said Musashi there. Miyamoto Musashi was a guy who challenged a few dudes, but mainly if they had like a, a head height disadvantage against him. All were very, very old. Oh my god, now I want to write an anime about a guy who just goes around challenging, like, enfeebled old men. <laughs> um, oh, side note, 
Uh, Team to the Junk, who is like Bellator and specifically Scott Coker, uh, his biggest fan, just found out he did a podcast about Bellator. And I like, that's my thing. I podcast about Bellator. No one else does. Um, I, to be honest, I am basically the only mainstream MMA podcast or, you know, relatively mainstream MMA podcast that does cover Bellator on the regular. And mainly I do it because it's bad. Um, but these lads, but the three of them have already like at minute three declared their fealty to Scott Coker. You know, it's like, I don't believe Scott Coker could do anything to turn these people against him or, or like draw any sort of criticism. Um, which, you know, is the, the anyone who supports Scott Coker at this point, that's the case anyway, because the man has, I mean, the man killed Dada and, uh, or, or, you know, almost killed Dada and uh, tried to book Kimbo again in a different country inside his drug suspension and booked Ken versus Hoist 3 and booked MVP versus a math teacher with five fights like half a year ago. But anyway, uh, what else was good on the weekend's card? Not a lot, to be honest. I mean, I like Loma Lukbumi. I love watching Loma Lukbumi fight. It was interesting because she was against an orthodox fighter fighting orthodox and she kept like hip pumping for the, the round kick and then throwing the, the front kick instead. But it was her and um, Luana Pinheiro, both of them just ragdolling their opponent from the clinch and their opponent kept coming back in and taking an upper body clinch. <laughs> like Luana, Luana Pienio, uh, Pien, Pienro? Pienro. Um, she was fighting Randa Marcos and every time Randa Marcos came close, she would grab over the back and perform not even just a head and arm, like a dope-ass judo throw, um, a haragoshi, whatever you want to call it. But an, uh, an ogoshi? I don't know. But, you know, she she was cheating in women's MMA because she was hitting the contractually obliged number of her head and arm throws. But she wasn't letting the other girl get on, get on her back afterwards. Uh, but, yeah, every time Randa Marcus grabbed her, she just slung her arm over the back and threw her on her head. And Randa Marcus just kept grabbing an underhook and, do, and letting her throw her again. Like, just ducking on the legs. Don't do upper body shit if they're just going to keep throwing on your head. And the same thing was true with um, Loma Lugbunmi constantly hitting those trips and dumps and knees on Sam Hughes. And she just kept attacking the upper body again. Ion Kutalaba, after the, uh, you know, just being the biggest prick in the world at the weigh-in, like he always does, managed to uh, get a split decision draw, which is downright hilarious. I mean, D Dustin Jacoby cheated his ass off in the first round because first round Ion Kutalaba is very scary. Second and third round Ion Kutalaba are just so-so. Um, and then Giga Chikadze knocked out uh, Cub Swanson with, as we said, step back onto Southpaw, throw the left body kick. So that's last weekend done. Let's talk about some of these fights coming up this weekend. Honestly, the event, not bad, despite the Michelle Waterson headliner. Um, things that stand out to me on this, Angela Re uh, sorry, Angela Re Amanda Rebus versus Angela Hill. Obviously, we always like Angela Hill. I mean, she forced a good fight out of Michelle Waterson. So, you know, nothing, nothing to um, sniff at. Um, and Rebus, basically, you know, she was hot shit until she got sparked by the lasses in the main event on this card. Marina Rodriguez, in a weird Herb Dean moment. Um, but who, who hasn't had one of those? Rebus, strong grappler. Angela Hill obviously does most of her work in the stand-up. Um, this is at straw weight. So, yeah, I mean, I like Angie's chances. Just depends on how good Rebus is at hiding her takedowns or how strong she proves in the clinch. Um, Maurice Green is back versus Marcos. D I mean, that's not interesting, actually. Neil Magny versus Jeff Neal. That's a good fight. Uh, you've got Neil versus Neil. But Magny coming off the loss to Michael Chiesa, which I barely remember, but before that he'd been on a, a decent three-fight tear against uh, Li Jing Liang, uh, Anthony Rocco Martin, which is a good fight, actually, and Robbie Lawler, who was ancient. You know, that was quite sad, watching Robbie Lawler not be able to pull the trigger as Neil Magny jabbed him. Um, and Jeff Neal coming off the, the pretty disappointing performance against Stephen Thompson. Um, this is one that sort of divides people because... There are people who are like, what could he do against Stephen Thompson? And my answer to that is like, try a low kick. You know, <laughs> like if you're, there are, you know, you could be like, oh, that's not Jeff Neal's game or whatever. But you have to be able to adapt somewhat to be, a, a, you know, a, t a truly elite level fighter. And Stephen Thompson, the secret has always been kick his legs, you know, and, and try and corner him. And basically Jeff Neal followed after him, throwing punches at his head. And he landed a really good number of them because you know you know Stephen Thompson's so hard to hit normally but he was still only connecting like a quarter of his punches thrown so he ended up throwing like 500 punches missing 
you know, 350 and looking really bad. But, you know, with Neil Magny, at least he gets more of an honest fight. Neil Magny is going to be there in front of him. Stephen Thompson is a very, um, you know, he's not going to give you anything for free. He doesn't feel like he's contractually obliged to take your punches. Whereas, you know, most people in the division will hang around and let you hit them. Um, could be, yeah, I mean, could be another Jeff Neal blowout because the man has power and speed. And if you're there for it, he's incredibly dangerous. Also, not bad at stopping a takedown and fighting out of the clinch, too. So, uh, Ma- whereas Magny likes to try and wear on people. I think, obviously, the, f- the later this fight gets, the more it favours Magny. But when you're only fighting three rounds, you know, it only takes a round and a half of Jeff Neal kicking his ass. He could basically, you know, he could be breathing out of his mouth and doing nothing in the third round. And Neil Magny might not be able to finish him. And uh, Neil still gets the decision. Because Neil is the more, you know, the way that Neil fights is far more eye-catching and impressive than, um, Neil, I mean, what Neil Magny does is impressive, but it's not attractive to, to fans and judges. Donald Cerrone versus Alex Moreno. Okay, this is the one that they, they uh, kicked Diego Sanchez out of. They should have just done the, the tough series because Joshua Fabia, as, as crazy and um, manipulative as he is, would have been a, an amazing season of tough against Donald Cerrone, you know, straight-talking Donald Cerrone. Um, but Morono is a good level of opponent for Cowboy at this stage because obviously uh, coming off that fight with Anthony Pettis where he had a lot of trouble with a very old Anthony Pettis or a very shop-worn Anthony Pettis at least. I'm quite interested by uh, Tafon Unchukwi who I haven't seen a lot of but I know has knocked out like all five of his opponents uh, professionally and a load as an amateur and he's fighting um, Jun Yong Park. I could see that being interesting. Um, Ryan Benoit's back and fighting a dude on a two-fight losing streak who came in at short notice. Oh, oh yeah, he was the guy who Tyson Nam finished. But um, yeah, three and three total record. Very strange. And then you've got Ben Rothwell and Philip Linz. Oh, and then the fight that I actually want to talk about, Diego Ferreira versus Gregor Gillespie. That, my friend, is a fight. I think this is really compelling because um, Diego Ferreira, if he can put the pressure on people, you know, uh, similar to Benil Dariush, you know, they had that fight and they are quite similar in their outlook. Um, if he can put the pressure on people and start applying his striking, um, he can really grind them down and, and tie them out and finish them. Gregor Gillespie, however, is the kind of guy who isn't going to let you do anything outside of the clinch, if possible. But this is Gillespie's long away to return after that uh, horrific knockout loss to Kevin Lee. A guy who everyone was very hot on. And to be honest, if you know anything about MMA you're still hot on him for the same reasons the dude just ran into someone who could wrestle very well and got head kicked um I think that you know that fight was interesting because he met a guy who could um dig under dig under hooks stop his takedowns long enough to keep him on the feet and he got in sort of a boxing match with Kevin Lee they just traded jabs for a while and then it was a cross counter across the top into a high kick but the more that I look at this one, um, the more I, as a massive Diego Ferreira fan, am a, and, uh, a little bit concerned. Ferreira, like, one of the things that's so cool about him is how hard he attacks people for going after his legs. You know, even against a guy as skilled grappling-wise as Benil Dariush, every time Dariush was in on a single or something, like, he's rolling on an omoplata, he's jumping over the back for a, uh, a crucifix, uh, very effective at attacking people on the takedown attempt. The issue with that i feel in this one is that gregor gillespie doesn't fuck around a lot with singles he tends to like his takedowns tend to be good level changes onto well-timed doubles and that that's the sort of thing where firstly it's hard to attack someone like you know when i say attack i mean threaten someone with a submission or a sweep or something like that or or wind up on top and that's what ferrero was able to do at many points against opponents shooting um high crotches and, and single legs or when he forced them down onto high crotch or single leg. The double leg, a lot of people end up grabbing the guillotine or something like that. It, it's just not... It doesn't have that nice... Um, you, you occasionally see a good rice bale over the top or something like that, but it's a lot harder to attack someone if they time a good double. And to be honest, the double is mainly timing anyway. If you time a good double, you should be able to get the guy down, and that's why the reactive double is such a um, a killer, particularly against fighters like Ferreira who want to come forward and apply pressure. You just show them the react- reactive double enough, they have to stop opening up in that same way. The other thing about Ferreira is, like, even though I mark out when he's attacking people off the takedown attempt, he'll still put himself on the floor and then spend too long on his back attacking them. Like, there was a there were periods against Darius where he's on his back attacking a triangle and you're going, no, you should just be 
freaking the fuck out and and, and trying to get up right now. You're not going to submit him, especially not an opponent this good from the bottom. That Darius fight is so good, by the way. There's a takedown. Darius takes him down. Ferreira elevates him and begins to roll through on the inside Sankaku san- uh, saddle, whatever you want to call it, to start leg locking. And Darius hops off him to the other side. Uh, it's, it's just full of really top tier shit in MMA, at least. I think for Ferreira, for Ferreira, body shots, I mean, he does throw body shots, but I'd love to see more of them. The uppercut to the chest on the level change, I really love that against wrestlers. It's not the most damaging punch in the world, but it is, you know, free free underhook, and you're probably not going to miss and get taken down. Like, you know, Ngannou versus Stipe, misses un- uh, missed like half a dozen uppercuts and got taken down off them because he was hitting the ring lights while um, Stipe was on his hips. But yes, this is a really lovely, lovely fight. I think if you're, if you're Ferre- Ferreira, you might get taken down. I'd say try to hit a stand-up and present the leg, put him on the single, and then attack him from there. Because I've definitely seen Gillespie use singles, and especially in like when he's returning people to the mat and things like that. He chains his stuff really well. It's just that his entries tend to be really good short double leg uh, level changes where he's basically boxed himself into the range. Honestly, in MMA, good double legs are basically an extension of boxing. You're not putting your knee to the floor and doing like a full penetration step. Anyway, I reckon that'll do us for today. Um, If you want to sign up to the Patreon, get in on the extra stuff we do for the boys, uh, support the podcast, do that. Sign up to the Patreon. Uh, If you aren't signed up to the Patreon and you wonder the sort of shit we do, I unlocked uh, Advanced Striking 2.0 Anderson Silver uh, on Friday. Uh, so if you want to go have a read of that, well, I say read, you can also listen to the audio track and follow along with the pictures. Um, because honestly, not everyone likes to read, but people do like absorbing information. Um, if you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. Also, if you are a boy, uh, the uh, Hunger of Jack Dempsey history episode is back up. Anyway, I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Michelle Waterson's Chun-Li kicks if Chun-Li were real and did no damage, bless.